is that you know we know how to multiply effect. <laughs> yes, that's right. you know your investment, your investment will not hold still. That's right. We've um, learned that when it comes here, of necessity yeah, for real. But yes, and again, I didn't want to digress too long into that, but it is a major, major challenge for the women's yeah. movement. And uh, I Relevance, think, right? yeah, yeah, they call it. How is this relevant to me? That's it. That's it. Yeah. But uh, oh, you were asking about the play. To, if I yeah. may go to that, yes, please briefly, because I think it's a, it's a, uh, partly a cautionary tale for the Equal Rights Amendment campaign, um, out of history. Mm -hmm. But a little personal background: in um, the early '90s, I was at this in Washington D.C. I went to the Smithsonian and saw a woman named Sally Rush Wagner do a first-person portrayal of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, Sally is a feminist scholar, activist. She has been the leader in saving the Matilda Joslin Gage house in Fayetteville, New York, near Syracuse. Gage, along with Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, were the three, I call it the triumvirate instead of triumvirate, <laughs> of uh, suffrage women at that second half of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And Gage actually got kind of drummed out of the core because she was too radical, uh, too forward looking. Yeah, I'd love to find out more yeah. about her. Yeah, and she, both she and Stanton took on the church too. Gage wrote something called Woman, Church, and State, which is um, not an equivalent to, it's a different kind of book, but Stanton wrote The Woman, the Woman's Bible, mm -hmm. which was taking the biblical text and commentary on it and rewriting, I guess, some of the text. But Anyway, um, I, Sally did such a wonderful portrayal of Stanton. I spoke to her afterward and I said, I'm from New Jersey. I would love to see if we could bring you to New Jersey, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was the start of cliche, the start of a beautiful friendship. We've stayed connected mm -hmm. and um, done a lot of feminist work together and are personal friends. And then in, the, in 1995, I reconnected for me, connected for Fred. Fred Morsell was in college with me at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania in the early 60s. And he's an actor, African American, um, portrayed Frederick Douglass and had developed a uh, speech which was a combination of Douglass's speeches and writings on women's rights. And he premiered it, the Park Service brought him in to be part of the um, a program celebrating the 85th anniversary of the 19th Amendment <laughs> and um, performed it in Ford's Theater. So my husband Sam and I went backstage, made the connection with Fred, mm -hmm. and um, I started doing some work to bring Fred to schools. He just does programs, or did then, uh, programs in schools and theaters and so on as Douglas, based on Douglas's autobiographies as well as the speeches and so on. Mm -hmm. So, long way around of saying, I saw both of them embody these two historical figures in such a way that I said it's as close as you come to feeling like you're in the presence, just astonishingly. And at one point in 1998, I was putting together with Barbara Irvine a program in Seneca Falls. There was a multi-day celebration celebrating the 150th anniversary of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. And at that convention, in 1848, Stanton radically proposed as one of the uh, resolutions that women obtain for themselves the sacred right to the elective franchise. And it was the most controversial of all the resolutions. <laughs> and it only passed because she asked her friend Frederick Douglass to stand up and speak for it in 1848. Yeah. So it was because of Stanton and Douglass together that the convention adopted that. And he was very active with her. They met doing abolition. They w worked on women's rights together over decades. But in after the Civil War, um, when the amendments were going out, 14th, 13th to abolish slavery, the 14th with all that that entails, the equal protection and due process and citizenship for the freed slaves and so on. Um, when the 15th Amendment came around, it said the right to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Everyone knew that meant that the male freed men would get the vote. No women, no black women. Mm -hmm. And it was because women were not enfranchised by the states who defined mm -hmm. the electorate. Um, and there was a schism. This is talking about, I'm getting to the point of 
the uh, cautionary tale. For, no, it's good. It's helpful. <laughs> um, Douglas, Lucy Stone, a white woman, uh, particularly women's rights advocate, also some abolition work, I, too, I think, too. Um, Julia Ward Howe. Um, I'm trying to think, but the, my point being that they were across lines of race and gender on both sides of this issue. The issue being, do we support the 15th Amendment to get the vote for the black males? Or they've been talking all along. All these allies were in support of universal suffrage, as they called it, for women and men, no matter what race, ethnicity. So do we take our half loaf now with the 15th Amendment, or do we hang tough and go for a 16th Amendment universal suffrage because Stanton, Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Robert Purvis, a uh, black man from Philadelphia, they were all on the side of don't work for the 15th Amendment because if we get that only, it will be decades before anyone picks up the issue of expanding the electorate again. Mm -hmm. Women will not have the vote for decades. And so there was, in Congress at the time even, a proposed 16th Amendment to give people universal suffrage. We never, I didn't learn this, did you learn? I didn't no, even learn I about didn't. the 15th Amendment <laughs> in my, my year. No. But um, the schism, there, there was a group set up called the American Equal Rights Association in, 19, eh, 19, in 1866, after the war. Mm -hmm. Douglas, Susan B. Anthony, Stanton, Lucy Stone, the New England suffragists, and uh, I mean, uh, women's rights activists and abolitionists and so on, everybody got together. Their goal was universal suffrage. And then three years later, when the 15th Amendment came down, they split because some of them said, we got to take the half loaf. Others said, if we do that, we're selling women, we're up the river, down the river for decades. Mm -hmm. And so um, clearly we know from history what happened was that the 15th Amendment did get ratified and that women's vote was not guaranteed until uh, 51 years later, yeah. 1920. Yeah. So that all played out as you would expect mm -hmm. um, happened if, that, if the 15th Amendment advocates had won that argument, internal argument, as they did. What happened was that the American Equal Rights Association imploded, exploded, whatever. It, it didn't last past that meeting in May 69. And Stanton and Anthony set up the National Women's Suffrage Association the next weekend. It was just like this, this, the <laughs> wow. movement split. Yeah. And it split into what's going to be putting black men first yeah. and what's going to be putting suffrage for all women, not just white women, mm -hmm. but, you know, first. In the course of that, there was a lot of um, regrettable rhetoric on both sides, but Stanton and Anthony, and Stanton even more maybe at that point, Anthony persisted more in playing class and race off against each other, uh, later suffrage. But um, Stanton um, and, and the other supporters were so offended at the thought that all men, including she, and she says, you know, Patty and this and that, and <laughs> Sambo even, Sambo. Oh even. my goodness. So, yeah, you know, she looks very racist, vote. even though the woman had been working for 20 years on abolition, um, yeah. et cetera. I'm not making excuses for her. It was her t the time in part and her anger and frustration. Yeah. But No talking in public when you're angry. <laughs> that's it, in any case. Um, so... What's come down in history, mm -hmm. and that got me to the point of being so tired of hearing people not informed about it that I had the right to play. I'm now coming back. Full yeah, so we go. Here. Good. Is that even in the last years, I've heard people say, "Yeah, and Frederick Douglass deserted the women's movement." Yeah, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Anthony—they were so racist. In fact, there was a sort of a demonstration when the statue of Stanton, Anthony, and Mott was raised to the rotunda of the Capitol in 1997. There was a National Council of, National Congress of Black Women, I guess it was, mm. um, was picketing outside, yeah. saying that these were racist women, there should be Sojourner Truth, and that 
All of which, again, talking about... There should be sojourner truth. And, there's, and there is. Thing. There is, there was at the time. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's all kind of, oh, if everybody knew everything I know. I'm joking, but... Yeah, well, sometimes but, you, know. you do have a little bit more insight, yeah. right? And yeah. you want to... Yeah, but what I did at that time was I couldn't stand this dissension over misinterpretations of what happened, mm. calling them racist, mm. saying Douglas deserted the women's movement. So mm. I arranged for Fred Morsell to come do a five-minute gig as Douglas in the dedication of the statue in the rotunda of the Capitol. It was a very powerful yeah. uh, time. And Fred did this speech in which Douglas himself has written about Lucretia Mott, Stanton, when there were a few places where the black man could lay his head, this woolly head of mine found a refuge in the home of Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, da, da, da. you know, all kinds mm -hmm. of juicy stuff. Still, we kept hearing all these misinterpretations, so finally my English major rose to the top, and knowing both Sally and Fred um, and their piece, you know, their presentations, I just was inspired to write this play around that time of the schism, and Stanton and Douglas only um, as the two antagonists. Again, we only look at the conflict, right? Mm -hmm. we, especially playwriting, right to the conflict. Well, yeah, no conflict, no play. That's right. That's for real. But <laughs> so I have this. It's about fifty-five page script. It was read by two actors at the ERA conference last November in uh, Rhode Island, Roger Williams University, because, as I said, not only does it let us know the both blessings and tribulations of trying to work together well across these lines, which are so fragmentable, mm -hmm. especially when people aren't approaching it with full goodwill and everything, mm -hmm. the race, gender, other lines too, but in this case, race and gender. Um, but it also shows us that when we don't work together well, the only ones who win are the, the masses, in this case, you know, yeah. massa, yeah. having us fight over the little piece of pie left on the windowsill. It's, it's just, I mean, you know, come on, divide and conquer is exactly. a time-honored thing, exactly. and it's a time-honored strategy, and, and it's so easy to keep, it's like when the, the, the tea party sort of go out to rile up the base, mm -hmm. and they hit the same notes over and over and over again. So all you have to say is, you know, Douglas abandoned the women's movement and That's everybody it. gets mad all That's of a right. sudden. And, you know, or Mal wouldn't include, you know, the lesbian coalition and everybody gets mad. And yeah. It's so easy to stay on that and to just touch that button again. That's right. Touch that button again. Exactly. And have if you keep, <laughs> Yeah. And, and on the one hand, I understand the pain of it. And at the same time... If you don't get rid of that button in your psyche, you know, this centuries, millennial old system is just going to plow right over you just like it always yeah. has. It, 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 it's too easy. That's it. You know? So, yeah, that was a long explanation, partly because I find both those, I just can't recommend highly enough that people find out more about both Douglas and Stanton. They're fascinating. They're monumental figures, and we're so well matched in their intellects, their logic, their senses of humor, they're just humanity yeah. that uh, you know I always try to say a word just for people to learn more about them but also what an object lesson lesson and cautionary tale to us they had enough residual friendship that they didn't just blow each other off for the rest of the, their lives mm -hmm. they, but there was a very uh, prickly patch they went through yeah. and uh you know, the, just, histories, the histories tell you that, you know, that Douglas and Stanton knew each other for a long time and worked together on these issues and these issues, and then let's do the post-mortem on this mm. big breakup. Yes, yes. You know, and pay attention to that, and you know. And, again, it keeps us stuck in the conflict, right? Yes. Stuck in that traditional narrative mm -hmm. of everything has to be yeah. um, a fist fight. And it, um, oh, I just about lost my point. One second, no. <laughs> because join the club. Yeah. I want you to. I want you to respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, but not talking about so what hard. happened after, or how they how they moved got back together. Yeah. How you know, it, just even that there really was that much coalition isn't that clear in most of your just sort of standard history books. No, not at all. And when you're there, right? When you're 
when you're now and you're thinking about whether or not to hook up with the lesbian coalition, pardon the sexual metaphor, but yes, um, uh, or you're Douglas and Stanton and you're these organizations trying to figure out what to do about the franchise, you're literally staring down both history and the future at the same time. Yes. And you don't That's know, I mean, you can, you. if you blink, you might lose, yeah. and if you stand there, you might lose. And it's impossible to really be able to tell which of those two decisions is going to get you down the road. I'm grinning because it's really hard. one of the, um, well, it's a prop, but it's it figures in the action, too, a chessboard, mm -hmm. half-finished game. Mm -hmm. and without being too heavy-handed, I hope, in the, the dialogue, but um, there's a point where um, one of, I'm trying to remember who makes the allusion first, but the idea is you're on your square, maybe you can see the squares around you, you have no sense of how the whole board is. It's only some other <laughs> uh, intelligence that's looking, I don't mean this yeah. theologically or anything by any means, but just, you know, and you um, can make your next move, but you don't know quite how that's playing out with everything else on the board right. when you're one of the chess pieces. Right. And um, that's the best we can do. And we just make the move we think is best for us where we are, mm -hmm. seeing just a little bit of the board. And um, we don't even know whether that is the right move till we see what the next move is from the opponent. And then. And there's a reason that chess works that way. That's right. That's right. And <laughs> it's so it's conflict yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it ties to a thing that um, that we talked about for a second when we took a break mm. about whether or not um, these kinds of political organizations are really the way things are going to work in the future. What these new generations are That's going it. to come up with to do, and this is also related to the question of alliance because mm -hmm. when I talk to um, people who do work in intersectionality or who work intersectionally mm -hmm. um, and do it consciously. Um, what I hear consistently is when you're staring down history and you don't know which move is going to be the right move, we, the other people who would like to be your allies, mm -hmm. <laughs> would appreciate it if you would just pick us first. And uh -huh. then if we, you know, because then the alliance is not broken. Mm -hmm. Right? So, okay. So, you don't get the 15th Amendment, but the alliance is not broken. That's it. That's it. And you can keep, you know, and, and what often happens historically with white feminists um, is that we've blinked, mm. you know, and not, not chosen the alliance over the pragmatic moment. Um, Boy, that's and at I, the core of this play's uh, challenge. Yeah. yeah. And I'm betting and I want to get your read on this, um, that where we're going in the next generation or so is that more people are going to choose the alliance and the relation oh. and the power of just being in community and mm -hmm. at work with these people over even political organizations. Because as long as you're doing political organizations, you're going to have to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And if you're over here, you might be able to invent a new set of choices or confront the system with a different set of choices. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that might be, that might eventually work better. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would like to. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, and I would like to theorize that, oh gosh, as long as we learn how to do better the old rules of the game, we're not transforming We're still the playing game. the old game. We're not transforming yeah. the game. Right. We may not look as effective for a while by playing by other rules, but odds are we aren't going to be that effective even learning the new, the old rules better. Well, the old uh, rules are not designed to work for us. That's right. There's that too. There's that <laughs> too. Know. But I do, I do think, um, and as we were referring to also, I mean, there, you know, the way government works, the way a democracy works, thank you Winston Churchill, is, is you know, it's the worst form of government except for any other. Uh, it's not efficient, it's not, uh, it can be effective in, within certain parameters, of yeah. course, but it's still better than any other um, possibility. This is, I'm not talking capitalism, I'm talking democracy. Yeah. Um, 
and or I'm not talking capitalist democracy, but you know, um, <laughs> well, yeah, a robust democracy. Yes. you know that's what I think. That's what a lot of social justice organizations.